In this Research Methods podcast, we're going to be discussing interviewing as a research methodology. My objectives are threefold. First, to briefly introduce interviewing as a research method. Second, to review the most common interview methods. And third, to provide some practical tips and techniques for doing interviews effectively. So why do we interview? What about this is a good research methodology? Well, interviewing is great if you're interested in exploring people's topics, getting interesting perspectives, and developing really rich understandings of people's attitudes, experiences. So the key purpose in interviewing is to contribute to theory and practice by uncovering fundamental meanings behind concepts, products, services, and experiences that people may hold. And there are four types of interviews that we're going to talk about today, from the unstructured to the semi-structured. So if we take a look at our first type, unstructured interviews, most of the time these are used in conjunction with observation. So if you haven't checked out the podcast on naturalistic inquiry, I'd suggest that you do so if you're interested in unstructured interviews, because typically they're used in conjunction with ethnography, ethnomethodology, and the critical incident technique. In those kind of naturalistic inquiry methodologies, what we tend to rely on are in informants, people who have experiences in the in the setting and are willing to chat with us to give us their perspective. But this typically isn't done in a very formalized, organized kind of way. It's on the spur of the moment. You have the opportunity to chat with someone, so you, you check in with them about something you observed, what it means to them, their reaction to a situation, they typically emerge quite or organically. And what they can give us is great meaning behind observed behaviors, artifacts, and rituals that as researchers, and especially if we're not members of the groups that we're interviewing, that we may not otherwise have access to. So the questions emerge based on the interviewer experience and the people that we have access to chat with. In in business settings, the customer service experience a lot of times is is where these will happen on a routine kind of basis. So if we have a customer or client who calls in with a compliment or complaint, we take their their inquiry, try and address their issue. But a lot of times we'll ask, so what really made you call in? What kind of impact will this have? Now, these are typically quite short, but they're a good example of a practical unstructured interview. When we do it in a research context, it's very much about our immersion into the context and trying to get more information so that we can better interpret our observations. So whereas in the unstructured environment, the, the interview happens quite organically, we don't have a plan about questions, they just sort of occur to us and we ask them as appropriate within the, the normal social interaction. A semi-structured interview is quite different. This is quite a planned interview. So if you're going to use interviewing as a traditional research methodology, this is one of the approaches to interviewing that you're likely to choose. So with this, we recruit participants for our interviews and we do a bit of prep work. So we think of questions. This is typically guided by our previous research, by theory, by our experience with whatever concept that we're studying. So we develop some themes that we want to talk about our primary questions. So again, in a customer service kind of experience, if we're going to interview consumers about their experience with a particular organization, we might want to start with a question like, what has been your experience with X organization? Now that's to open the door. It's open-ended, so we're not asking a yes or no or rate this organization. It's what, how, tell me about kinds of questions. The thing is that a lot of beginning interviewers will make the mistake and have a list of five or six themes that they want to address, have their particular questions that they have thought up, their primary questions, but they don't get a lot of richness out of the interview because semi-structured interviews rely on good follow-up questions. It's a conversation. So if think about it this way. If you have a friend and you say, so how was your day? And they say, terrible. What's the natural follow-on from that? Oh, God, tell me what happened, right? Secondary questions are where you learn the most 
about this about people's experiences, their attitudes, and their reactions. The open-ended question opens the door, but the secondary questions are about developing the conversation. And that's the way you want to think about semi-structured interviews, is that they're a conversation that, that you're directing in terms of the particular themes that you want to address. Now, semi-structured interviews can take place one-on-one -on -one or in groups. We'll talk more about the focus groups next. But in a one-on-one -on -one kind of setting, it is about having a nice conversation. If you're a good conversationalist, a semi-structured interview methodology might be one that you can choose. So these can take as little as 30 minutes. I wouldn't recommend going less than that because odds are you're probably not getting much out of the interview. Up to several hours, depending on people's time and availability. But so if you want to think about different examples of these traditional journalist interviews that you hear tend to be semi-structured interviews. There are themes that they want to talk about. There are clearly questions that they want to ask, but it's about the good interaction. Even job interviews can be good examples of these. Tell me about your experience in this industry. Or you say on your CV that you've done this job. Where, how, why? Those are the secondary questions. So the semi-structured interview is really the bread and butter of interviewing. This is the one that is the most commonly used in research methodology. Then you take the semi-structured interview and you put it into a group setting and you have a focus group. Now, whereas the conversation with a a one-on-one -on -one semi-structured interview, it's about the interaction between the researcher and the participant, the focus group is about the interaction between the participants themselves. So the group is the inter interview, not the individuals. The researcher's job is really to be there as the referee. So you're there to start the conversation, to keep the conversation on track, but what you really want to see is a natural conversation emerging between the participants. A lot of times, um, it's the focus group is interesting because it's as much about the the group dynamic as it is about the particular content that they offer. Now, in my experience with focus groups, a lot of times you'll have some kind of stimulus. So food and drink um, evaluations of new products or existing products are great examples of these. So you bring in a sample for everyone. And you say, here's a sample of, of this food, this drink. Taste it and let me know what you think about it. So what you're looking for is how people react, how people build on each other's conversation. So it's quite a naturalist kind of experience because you're looking at observation as well as content. So this is done in advertising and marketing all the time. It's really one of the cornerstones of getting new product development, product evaluation, evaluation of campaigns. So for public relations, what kind of messaging would be appropriate? We see this also with expert panels. So if you think about the focus group, you as the researcher need to have some kind of stimulus, something that gets the conversation started. It can be primary questions. You should always have the secondary questions, but it can be something material. You could show people a video, bring in a product to sample, have them do an activity, and then get the reactions based on that experience. So it's quite a flexible way of getting some kind of interaction and an interview going. So from the focus group then, we leave the very flexible kind of structure and we move into highly structured types of interviews. If you want to think about a highly structured interview, they're basically a questionnaire that's given verbally. You will have a mix of open and closed-ended questions, but these, whereas the focus groups and the one-on-one -on -one semi-structured interviews could go on for quite a while, and the unstructured ones are just about kind of a spur of the moment, this you have an agenda, you have very specific research objectives, and you need to make sure that everyone answers pretty much the same questions. So you can have open-ended questions, how and why kinds of questions. A lot of times these are, rate your experience with this, a one to five. They're typically speaking very few second up, secondary questions, very few follow-ups. It's mostly primary questions. So it's around a particular research 
research objective. Good examples of these, phone surveys, we don't get a lot of these anymore, but consumer interviews, if you've called in for customer service, a lot of times you'll be asked, would you take a few minutes and answer a few questions? That's what this is, it's a highly structured interview. The thing about it is, is that it's delivered, the difference between this and just a questionnaire is it is delivered verbally to folks. So you might think of a person on the street kind of interview. You know, you get, you're walking down the street and someone says, can I ask you a few questions? Have you ever bought this product? Have you ever thought about this politician? Whatever the case may be. But these are the least flexible and the most planned out. So instead of thinking about themes, it's about thinking of the particular questions that you ask. Now, no matter the kind of interview that you're doing from the unstructured to the highly structured, let's talk about some tips and techniques for making effective interviews. And absolutely, the first thing that you have to keep in mind is that you need to build rapport with your participants. Rapport is a demonstration of mutual trust and respect between the interviewer and the interviewee. Why is it important? Well, because if your participants don't believe that you have their best interests in mind, that you're not an honest broker, you're probably not going to get very much out of them. They're not going to be likely to chat with you for very long, and they're certainly not going to have a lot to say, you know, that, that's very revealing. No one's going to bear their soul to you if they don't trust that you're going to use that information fairly or that you have positive intent. So when we're thinking of rapport and rapport building, there are some stages of rapport building. So when you first encounter an interview and when the first time you sit down with someone, you're going to have some apprehension. The initial apprehension phase is really characterized by uncertainty that stems from the strangeness of, of the context where there is someone who's asking you a set of questions. So during this phase, the goal is to get the interviewee talking. So the first question you ask should be broad, open-ended, and really reflect the nature of the research. But most importantly, it should be non-threatening. So if necessary, the question can be repeated with a bit of embellishment, so it gives the interviewee time to hear what's being asked. So you might summarize your goals with the, per with the research, what you're interested in, and then say, and so my first question is really about your overall in reaction to this, whatever the, the topic might be. As responses are given, then the interviewer can turn turn and respond with prompts that repeat the words used by the interviewee. So if you're using their words to summarize what they're saying, the process then signals that there's need for cl clarification and without leading the interviewee to a particular end or perspective. After you get over the apprehension stage and someone's pretty free and easy with their conversation, then comes the exploration stage. So the exploration phase is when the interviewee becomes really engaged in an in-depth description. You're not having to lead them. So it's a process that is focusing on learning, listening, and really testing the sense of bonding and sharing. It's not that you're becoming friends with your interviewee. It's that they're feeling like they can talk to you in a fairly comfortable and relaxed manner. But they're then... Once they're fine with the exploration, you come to cooperation. So this cooperative phase is characterized by a comfort level where the participant isn't afraid of offending and they can find satisfaction in the interview process. So the interview can, the interviewer can clarify certain points and the interviewee can correct the in interviewer. So they're making sense of the interviewee's world. This can also be the time where you start asking sensitive questions. If you've never seen Louis Thoreau, um, he is a great person to watch some of his documentaries. What he's able to do is be really unimposing. So he meets with some really controversial, sometimes quite dodgy people. But what he does is he builds, he works through the apprehension, the exploration phase. And what you find is that he's able to get to really sensitive questions where people share, share information they have never shared with any journalist before, anyone before. 
because he's done this in this cooperative way that I'm just trying to understand. Correct me if I'm wrong. What Tell me about this experience. And so people will start to reveal a lot more information about it. So if the interview process continues for long enough, or if the interviewer and interviewee develop some kind of rapport rapidly, the participation stage is next, and it can occur in an in-depth interview. So these tend to be a bit longer, but this reflects the greatest degree of rapport. It's the point at which the interviewee takes on the role of guiding and teaching the interviewer about whatever the subject matter is. So at the participation phase, really your interviewee takes over and they start offering more information. And so you become more of the referee. You know, when I talked about the focus group, that the ideal for the, for the, um, interviewers just to be kind of the referee guiding and kind of keeping the conversation on focus. That's what the participation stage is really about, that you have your participant and your interviewee chatting quite freely. You just kind of keep them directed around the topic that you're most interested in. So if you can get through these four stages, then you probably have built a pretty good interview and you're getting great data out of it. But it's also an indicator if you never get to the cooperation phase that a lot of the information you may be getting might be a bit superficial. But how do you select your interviews, interviewees? Who do you use as your participants? Well, keep in mind that your, your goal with interviewing is not to generalize to a population. So one of the tips that you should think of is homogeneity. So if you think about the penguins, you know, in a particular breed of penguin, they all pretty much look alike. This is what your this is what homogeneity is talking about. It's that your participants all sh- share particular critical similarities related to the research question. So if you are interested in consumer perspectives, you might narrow that down from any potential consumer to women under 30 to men over 40 because there will be some kind of rationale for what they share. This is typically guided by previous research, and a lot of times it's also guided by who we might have access to. So in public relations or in any field, if you are interested in interviewing managers, you might think about the types of managers and the types of organizations that you would have access to and go from there. But Beyond the notion of homogeneity, then, the question is, how do you ask good questions? What are good open-ended and closed-ended questions? So I know I talked about this a little bit before, but let's make sure that we have a really firm handle on the difference between these. So a closed-ended question would be to ask, is your hair black, brown, red, green, whatever it might be? Are you interested in research? Those have very set answers, and so if you're doing a highly structured interview, those might be necessary. An open-ended question would be, how would you describe your hair color? What are your academic interests? So these are the same types of questions, getting at the same information, but asking it in two very different ways. So why might you choose closed versus open-ended questions? Well, closed-ended questions provide specific or implied answers, so you're trying to limit the breadth of information that the respondent can offer. Open-ended questions, on the other hand, allow the respondent to answer with really very few limits. It's just about staying on topic. So open-ended question words are who, what, when, where, why, and how. Now, one caution on this. You want to limit the types of why questions that you ask because oftentimes for in, uh, participants, it implies that there is a right answer. So it sounds almost accusatory. So if they say, well, I really like having this kind of, this kind of beer. Why? It can sound quite bracing. So you can ask a why question. You just sometimes need to change the wording. So could you explain what about this beer is tasty for you? So a lot of times it's a small, subtle wordings, but this is where interviewing really comes to task, is when you're developing the questions, it's important that you do and don't do certain things. So first, you need to make sure that you avoid leading questions. 
Leading questions are phrased to suggest that there is a particular answer and imply that one answer is expected or more correct. We want to allow people to answer in their own terms and their own voices, their own views, values, and experiences. You don't want to, people are already, if they're willing to have an interview with you, they want to try and help you out. Though well-intentioned, if you reveal too much about your purpose of the interview or what you might be really interested in, a particular product, a particular perspective, people will accommodate that. And so you can bias your own findings by asking leading questions. So examples of leading and non-leading questions would be like these. A non-leading question is, what do you think about people traveling to the UK for medical treatment when they don't have coverage in their own country? A leading question is, don't you agree that we should clamp down on health tourism? Because it suggests that there is, quite clearly, a perspective that you care the most about. Another example of a non-leading question is, what do you think about language policies for immigrants in the UK? Versus, wouldn't it be better if we insisted that immigrants speak better English? Again, you want to give people the opportunity to respond in a way that is quite natural for them. The key to successful interviewing is also learning about how to probe effectively. If you're not giving away the answer that you're trying to, to look for, you're going to get what's unsaid. So the problem with leading questions is that it's what's said, it's what you demand. Yet, like the tip of an iceberg, it's what's unsaid that you're trying to get at with any kind of an interview. So we want to allow people then to answer with their own voices and in their own ways, no matter what we may think about it, no matter what our research objective might be, because we need to get an honest assessment of what they understand. So probing questions, the who, what, when, where, why, and how, try to get at that and avoiding leading questions are also necessary. So if someone offers their opinion, make sure that you follow up. This is the secondary question that you need to make sure that you answer. So if we're thinking about probing, both in terms of avoiding leading questions as being the tip of the iceberg, but also probing as a technique, the key to successful interviewing is really learning how to probe effectively. So there are some good probing techniques that you can use. What questions, the silent probe, the echo probe, and the aha uh -huh probe. So the probing questions really are the what kinds of questions. The, if you're asking what, or you're asking, well, how can you explain that? You're looking for them to elaborate. The silent probe is particularly effective. People don't like silence. So if you just wait, remain quiet and wait for an informant to continue, they will just keep going. Now, all too often, we're afraid of silence ourselves. And so we start filling it with, with what we're saying what we're thinking. And so the interviewee tends to not then be the focus of the interview. We tend to start talking more and more and more. Learning to just sit quietly and let the respondent think. You know, if you're asking questions, especially early in an interview, before you've built rapport and before the participant is really warmed up, a lot of times people need to have a bit of a think about what they're saying. If you direct them, you can go down the path of leading questions. But even if they've answered the question initially, if you're silent, let them have a moment to kind of get their thoughts together and elaborate. Another probing technique is the echo probe. So you repeat the last thing the informant said and ask them to continue with an IC. So if the child has, ha, is not able to sleep at night, what happens? So you repeat their conversation and then you follow up with a, what happens next? But this kind of summary again gives them a chance to gather their thoughts and prepare a response in their head.
The aha probe, you can do this as a head nod. You can do with a, oh, I see, right, uh uh-huh. It's about encouraging the participant to continue their narrative by just making some kind of affirmative nonverbal. Probing and being patient with an interviewer and an interviewee is really an important part of getting a good interview. You want to make sure that you give people enough time and not make them feel rushed. The more that you start interjecting, the shorter their answers will become. And then let's take a look at some general tips and techniques. So a lot of this that I've been talking about is letting the informant lead the conversation. You know, certainly as you build better rapport within the interview, this becomes easier. But there are definitely techniques to help improve the conversation from their perspective. So don't begin interviewing right away. Have a little bit of side chat. You know, talk about yourself, talk about them, their interests, a couple of minutes of just icebreaker conversation, just normal conversation. If the weather's great, if the weather's rubbish, if, you know, the something going on in the news that's, that's quite benign, just kind of warm them up a little bit. So don't be jump into the interview right away. You also need to make sure that you listen and express interest in the informant. Value them as a person. So try to encourage them to expand their answers but also let the informant's answers determine the direction of the interview. Obviously within the topic of study, but if you have questions one through eight or themes one through eight, if they kind of, if what they're saying connects from question one that you had thought of to question four, go to question four. You can always loop back around to your other questions, but let their answers determine the direction, the order of question, the way that you're presenting the themes. Most importantly, whenever you can, you need to do a bit of background research on your participants so that the language that you use makes sense. And likewise, as you develop the interview, use their own language to ask questions. And then as a rule of thumb, you want to think about an 80% rule. They should be talking 80% of the time. You should only be talking about 20% of the time. These kind of general tips and techniques end up making sure that the information that you gather is up about the informant, not about you. So you don't matter in this other than being the, the referee, the conversational partner. It's always about your, your informant, your participant. And so then the last tip and technique is how do you capture the data? Anytime that you can, you need to make sure that you record the data. Now, of course, you have to ask permission. They have to give their permission to be recorded. But I would also say make sure you have a backup device. So if you record them on your phone, also have a second kind of backup because data because technology can fail or technology can have unexpected limits that you may not know anything about. But make sure to record with probably ideally at least two different types of recordings. Second, make sure you fully transcribe the data. It's important because once it's written, you're a lot more able to analyze it. You can use Um, different kinds of analytic techniques, whether it's hand coding, you could do content analysis with it, you could do use programs like in vivo. There are lots of different ways that you can approach your data analysis from interviews, but all of them really need you to fully transcribe it. Also, keep in mind the ethical issues. It's important that you as an interviewer reduce the risk of unanticipated harm. A lot of times, this is about protecting your sources, making sure that they can't have any kind of negative repercussions. Now, in doing research with organizations, a lot of times organizations will want to be able to associate who said what. Absolutely not. If you're doing this and if an organization is pushing you to reveal and the participant has not expressly given you the the right to reveal names and and all of that it is your responsibility to protect your source so making sure that participants understand what risks that you minimize those risks and that everything's informed and consented along the way 
So the other bit of this, you want to inform the interviewee about the nature of the study. What's the big picture? What's the concept? But you don't want to give away your perspective or the particular set of research questions that you're asking, because then they will try and help you out. And that can really taint the information so that you have to balance the ethical issue of informing them what the conversation's about with making sure that you don't give too much away that leads them. And finally, you may need to make sure with your participants, and especially if you're working with groups that could potentially be at risk, it might be youth, it could be homeless, it could be any group that can be, can typically be viewed as a vulnerable group, making sure that they're not exploited by the process of participating in the, in the interview. Now, there's a whole lot of ground that you can cover with interviewing and a whole lot of ways that you can do that. But this has been our introduction to interviewing in this podcast. Make sure that you read more about this if this is an interviewing technique that you're planning on using for your own research and in your dissertations, theses, projects, whatever it might be.